So the agenda for today, uh, we'll do a quick intro to the course and recap on Excel frameworks. Uh, so that'll be the first little bit, and then we'll go into um, some applications of analytics and then go into uh, sort of applications of Excel, uh, specifically using pivot tables. And then we'll talk about R and science of data visualization, um, potentially go into uh, some more events uh, or intermediate rather uh, functions as well as modeling. Um, I might jump through some of the slides uh, because I really wanna get to kind of the more setting up models at the end as well, depending on how we do on time and uh, how many questions we get. So very quickly about me, uh, my name is Eric. I am the CEO at Events Analytics and Research Lab. So we are an analytics services company. Uh, personally, uh, I have three degrees. So I have a business degree from Western uh, Ivy Business School. I have my honor specialization in economics, and then I have my master's of science in analytics. And I've done a ton of projects in analytics, uh, seeing stuff that works, seeing stuff that hasn't, and more perhaps uh, relevant for this course, I have been teaching statistics, analytics, and economics for close to 15 years now. And I've taught this Excel workshop specifically quite a few times as well. Here's just some fun stuff about me. Uh, I am a trained barista, learned, learned how, to, how to make latte art in Italy by the guy who invented latte art. Uh, his name is Luigi, uh, super fun experience. Uh, I love volunteering. Uh, actually, the company uh, that I started works with nonprofits a lot in analytics. Uh, I do a little bit of art. Here's a picture of me at the dinosaur vault at the Royal Ontario Museum, a little bit of motorcycle racing, and uh, here's me at graduation, but that's, that's a while ago now. So a little bit about Events Analytics and Research Lab, or ARL, or people call us the Analytics Lab or the Lab. So we offer analytics services, solutions, consulting, education. And our mission really is to be the fastest and easiest way for any organization to gain full analytics capabilities. For the price of one analyst, you can get an entire specialized team. Specifically, our education mission is to create education that's practical enough for everybody to start using analytics in your day-to-day, -day, whether it's in their personal or professional settings. For this fall, we are running uh, a series of workshops. So after today's Excel workshop, we will still have data visualization and reporting automation. And then we will be doing a intro to R uh, using statistics. Sorry, intro to statistics using R rather. And then upcoming, we have high, o high ROI analytics uh, for management, some people analytics and social sector analytics. And to keep in mind, uh, all these workshops, the profits are donated to charity, uh, specifically uh, ones that have some sort of relevance combating COVID-19 for this year. All right, a uh, quick pop quiz. What are some disciplines of data science that we talk about from last week? Uh, or rather, what are the cross disciplines in data science? I'll switch back. See if there's any answers. Cross disciplines in data science. So um, it's the intersection. Maybe maybe it's a, not a great question. <laughs> it's intersection of statistics, mathematics, computer science, and subject matter expertise. Uh, what are the three types of data? There's different types of data that we talk about from last class. All right. Uh, uh, so, oh, Ian, we got structure and unstructured. Yeah, that's definitely part of it. Prescriptive, descriptive from Emerald. So that's types of analytics, uh, but you can actually say descriptive is a type of data, yeah, big and small data. 
So what I was looking for is uh, the data science uh, definition, which has more to do with structured versus unstructured and uh, big versus small data. And in the statistical definition, it's uh, uh, cross-section data, time series data, and panel data. Uh, and what is the four general problem solving steps? I, I think I mentioned in the last uh, class, uh, if there's anything you should take away from that class, it's the four steps to solving every problem in your life. Give you a second to type it out if there's four steps. Maybe not. All right. So uh, four steps to problem solving. Number one, objective. That's right. Fiona, thank you. Number two, figure out all your options. Oh, opinions. Options. And then number three, analyze the options. And number four, uh, make a decision. So analytics is a toolbox. Problem solving with facts and data uh, is basically what analytics is. It's a problem solving methodology and mindset, especially I think for these courses, uh, because they're quite short and very foundational. Uh, I want to give you the framework of how to think about data and analytics problems. And for the most part, you can figure the details on your own. It's like, uh, here's an analogy. If you learn how to cook, uh, if you learn how to uh, different knives works, if you learn how to cut different things, different types of food and different types of cooking food, uh, heating it, steaming it, baking it, and all, all those kind of things. So those are the frameworks that you can go and learn different recipes specifically uh, by following the instructions. So I want to give you that foundation and framework. So today's class, uh, a little bit harder to teach, I think, because everybody ex excels skills a little bit different and we're not in a classroom setting. So I can really go around the classroom and try to debug if there's any sort of problems. So what I would suggest is um, if, if I'm working on an Excel example during the class, either uh, just follow along uh, on the screen or try to uh, do like, if you have two monitors, have one monitor with my, my Excel sheet and then one monitor with your, with your own. Or if you can try to split the screen between the two to try to follow along. The examples I'll be doing will be pretty um, simplified. So you should be able to follow along and I'll try to go as close as I could uh, given our time constraints. And just a quick note, uh, I mentioned this last time as well. Uh, you can get a certificate uh, through LinkedIn and I'll send you a, uh, details on how to get that. Jumping right into Excel. So there's two main things you can do with Excel. You can store data and you can do model building or calculations. So storing data, uh, we talked about last time, there's three types of data, but there's also structure on structure and all that fun stuff. Uh, when you're storing data, you want to keep it as organized as possible. And then for the right model building, so once you have some calculations, uh, sorry, once you have some data and numbers, either you store it in Excel or you're pulling it from a data set or you're trying to compile some information manually. Once you have those data, then you have to run analysis. And what Excel is really great for is complex calculation. And actually one of the earliest uses of computer, like early, early stage, like name frames are for doing uh, Excel modeling uh, in, in, in a certain sense, uh, spreadsheet calculations. Uh, and a really important thing about Excel, especially once you get past the beginner stage is short keys. So, Everything you can do on Excel, and actually you can anything you can do on a Windows computer can be done without touching the mouse. And if you're able to learn the short keys and shortcuts, uh, depending who you, who you ask, it's called, you can be super, super fast in uh, running these calculations. So there's a bit of a running joke. If you want to work for our company, 
we take your mouse away on the first day uh, and you have to do all, everything just using your keyboard. Not actually, but I really want to try that one day. And uh, just to keep in mind, there's really two main uh, type of short keys on a Windows computer, which is the Alt and the Control button. Uh, and Alt is a specific group of functions and Control is a specific group of functions. Control uh, plus whatever usually has to do with uh, things that's across platform, whereas Alt has to do with the specific software you're in. Uh, so the most common one I think everybody probably knows is control C and control V, which is copy and paste. Um, and just a quick note in Mac, usually the substitute is command and alt, and you use uh, shift and all those kind of things in conjunction to create the short keys that you need to do for whatever analysis you're doing. Some common functions, uh, just really high level, uh, because this is more beginner things. Um, in Excel, there's things you can, uh, more complex calculations you can do using functions. It always start with a equal sign uh, within the cell. And the most common ones are aggregation functions. So your, uh, your traditional um, operators, these are called, <laughs> I almost forget, plus, minus, multiply, and divide. Um, summing an array or a combination of numbers, averages, counts, min and max. These are, these four are really the bedrock of every statistical calculation. And again, this is still high level. So linking, uh, the beauty of Excel is that you're able to link, uh, uh, one cell to another cell. And there's this thing uh, called absolute and relative linking. And you use F4 or dollar signs within your linking to explain, uh, to, to call that uh, absolute and relative linking. F2 uh, lets you enter a cell. And when you're linking, you can also link to an array or you can link to another sheet. Uh, shift F11, uh, that's uh, Excel opening a new sheet, or you can actually link to another workbook. So going back, checking if there's any questions. Alrighty. If there's any questions about these, uh, feel free to ask me after. I'm aiming to finish as close to 8, 10, 8, 15 as possible. So we'll have 10, 15 minutes at the end for questions. All right, going to pivot table. What is a pivot table? A uh, pivot table is one of those really, really cool Excel uh, functions that a lot of people use. And essentially what it does is it automatically performs aggregation on your data. So if you think about the most common type of calculations you'll do on Excel, usually you're doing this set of aggregations some averages count minimum and maximum. So pivot table automatically performs that and gives you a summary table. And we'll do an example on this uh, in a few slides. So first off, you have to decide uh, to build a pivot table, you have to decide two main things. And this actually works with data visualization as well. So you want to decide on your dimension and your measure. So dimension is the category you want to segment your data on. So as an example, let's say a grocery store um, and you're looking at revenue, one dimension could be you wanna break down your revenue by product. So revenue per apple, bananas, oranges, or another dimension that's really popular is time. So revenue for the grocery store, per um, per month, let's say, and then you can break it down even further uh, per month by apple, by bananas and oranges. The measure is the metric you wanna measure or aggregate on. So it could be average, sum, or min, max. Then you can use pivot table to filter, move things around, add more metrics, things like that. So uh, really quick demonstration. 
going right into our Excel file. Just zoom in a little bit, a little bit so everybody can see. So the data I've provided here, it's fake uh, building, uh, let's call it condo information. So everybody uh, live in an apartment or a condo or a house, right? So hopefully it's uh, not too hard to understand. So essentially this is a uh, panel data. So there is uh, time information. So we have year, month, date, the type. So this is something that we can segment things on. Different filters, prices for each of the apartment it's renting for, locations, floor, and so on. All right, so super quick tip. If you want to jump from one end of the uh, data to the other end, you can hold control and move right and left. That jumps straight to the end and back. Uh, and then same thing, if you hold down control, you go up and down, then it goes to the top and the bottom. Uh, super useful. Uh, I probably use that short key tens, if not hundreds of times a day, if I'm modeling Excel. And then another quick tip, if you do control and you hold down shift, so you hold down control and shift and you go right, you'll select the entire uh, data set. And that's true if you do, if you use your mouse and if you do, if you let's say click on one cell and if you hold down shift and you select another cell, it's everything in between. But the point of me doing that was to show you, okay, um, I want to know how many columns they are. I just do control shift right. And then on the bottom, it says count equals 12. So there's 12 columns. And then if I want to know how many rows they are, I just do control shift down. So there's 104 rows. I mean, you can also look at this number here. Alrighty, switching back, questions, no questions, great. All right, so uh, short key, I wanna make a pivot table. I will select all the data first. So I do control A, that selects everything. So for that to work, your data, uh, your cursor or your cell selection has to be on the table, control A selects the whole thing, or you can do control shift right and down or you can do the old fashioned way, which is dragging with your mouse, but see how much longer this takes. Uh, I think some of my teachers used to say the difference between using short keys and mouse could save you a couple hours a day. So definitely worth the time to learn it and get used to it. I used to have a, uh, this is very nerdy. I used to have a, uh, a page of Excel short keys taped to my bedroom which doubles as my office when I was a student. And actually in our office, uh, there was a, <laughs> there's a short key uh, poster on the wall as well. Anyways, okay, select everything, insert, and we wanna insert a pivot table, which is this one right here. Click on it, click okay. And there's your pivot table all set up. Another way to do that, the short key way, you do control A, and then you do the Alt short keys. So Alt short keys opens up the menu and you can see all these letters here that pops up. And then you can say N, which is insert, V, which is pivot table. So when I'm building a pivot table, I do Control A, Alt and V, enter, done. So I think that's 10 times faster than using a mouse. All right, so uh, we want to, First off, look at this field here and these four boxes here. So these are all the different columns inside the pivot, uh, inside that data sheet. Oh, let's make sure we name this pivot. Keep that one. Oh, uh, I did that really quick. But what I did was right click and then D enter. D just goes to delete and then just deleted that sheet. Let's see. All right, so let's say we wanna do uh, prices on the bedroom type. So no bedroom, one bedroom, two bedroom. 
and let's say we want to do uh, prices. There's price, so we can drag the price to values. So this value is basically the measure uh, that I was talking about in the PowerPoint. So we can do value setting, average. Then here we have uh, average price for all the segments. So super powerful, uh, very quickly uh, create a summary table without uh, too much of a fuss. Of course, we want these in dollar signs, so we can do Control Shift, select the whole thing, go to Home and dollar sign, or another short key, Control Shift uh, down, and then Control Shift four or dollar sign in your keyboard, and it turns everything into dollar signs. So that's a handy trick uh, for any of the values here. If you do Control Shift, and if you do one, two, three, four, five. Hold down Control Shift. One is a uh, general numbers. It just changes the format. Two is time. Three is date. Four is dollars, and five is percentages. So it corresponds with the symbols on your keyboard. So back to dollars. So really fun. Uh, another thing I want to do. Let's say this one plus den should be between one bedroom and two bedrooms. So you do right click here, move it up. There you go, right click, move up, uh, move up again. You have to make sure you just select the cell when you do this. Up. And then this two den as well, I just wanna move it up. Great, okay. So that's uh, really quickly pivot tables. I'll, I'll leave the, uh, the examples at the end when we're doing practice. And then we also want to add and uh, refresh data. So, um, oh, just keep in mind these numbers uh, might be different between mine and yours because I randomly generated these data. So actually, if I press F9 on my keyboard, all these data will, all these numbers will change because I simulated these data. All right, so let's say you have this data set and now you're adding 2020 January first a new data set and you know whatever these data are five 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 patient one all right so this table won't reflect this new data because it's not selected so what you would then do is oops uh, here we go. What you would do is you go to click on this table here. It'll say pivot table analyze, change data source. And then all you have to do is reselect this entire table. See, now it includes this bottom row. Then all the data is updated. If you have to change an entry in here, all you have to do is go to pivot analyze and refresh, and then you'll just change up the data. Or what I do is more short key, which is Alt F5. We'll update the numbers as well. Add a slicer. Okay. Another cool thing you could do. Uh, well, let's say we also want to add price per square foot, which is price divided by square footage. A very common metrics uh, real estate agents use. Averages. All right. So let's say we want to add a slicer for uh, parking included, let's call it. All right, so we can go to pivot. So click on the table, pivot table, analyze at slicer. Then you can say, okay, I want to have parking included and I want to include uh, bathrooms. All right, then here's a little interactive thing. If you're building a report, then people can click on it and you'll automatically change up uh, and slice and dice the data based off of the selection that you make. So you can have multiple selection if you click on this thing. So one, two, three bathrooms, clear selection, and so on. Okay, so that's quick pivot. Jumping right into data visualization. So we usually do a, 
a more comprehensive data visualization course, but I'll do a summary for uh, our insights of data visualization here. All right, so our insights of data visualization. Just turn that on, there we go. All right, so data visualization, super, super important. Data by itself doesn't mean anything to anybody. Uh, you have to uh, analyze it, summarize it, turn it into charts and bars for it to make sense. So what I usually say is you have to have these four important, important components for a data visualization. You'd have to have the question. So why are you building the data visualization? You have to have good data. And obviously that's a very loaded <laughs> definition. Yeah. Having good data is actually very, very complicated uh, most of the time. Context, uh, so what is the background? And then so what? What what action or, or reason are you showing the data? Then you have a compelling story. So super important, the so what? Every time you present a fact or every time you hear a fact, always remember, so what? Why? Why is this happening? Why are you telling me this? What can I do with this information? And I almost want to say just asking that one question uh, will upgrade uh, thinking, anybody's thinking from a passive observer to a thinker. So super important, um, you know, um, I mean, even as you kind of walk around on the streets, instead of just looking at things, looking at things and, and just walking past things, you know, asking, so what, every time you see anything, will really make you like a philosopher. <laughs> All right, the science. So a little bit uh, more uh, on the science of data visualization. So first off, information design is a profession. Uh, you could do a whole degree on information design and information visualization. There's lots of books out there. Uh, there is, I think, uh, you can take a course I think in most major university and even OCAD art schools, I think they have these like data visualization courses. So what is data visualization? Uh, can anybody give me some thoughts on what data visualization is? I'm sure everybody has some idea. Put it in the chat. Use data to tell a story, Vicky. Yep, a graphical representation for sure. I mean, I'll, I'll say those two; those two things combined are pretty good. <laughs> Answer already. Uh, graphical representation. Whoops. Graphical representation of data and relationship. process of abstracting data into meaningful information. For sure, Ian, thank you. Portraying analysis to be understood by any person. Fiona, thank you. Great. Yeah, so, I mean, those are all correct. And um, I'll just go down into a little bit more specifics, but, but for sure, uh, data visualization, the purpose of it is certainly to tell a story help you transform data into, uh, we talked about last time, transform data into information, into insights, and then into action. So what kind of things can you do to display data? Well, data visualization, to visualize data, you can literally just put a number into your PowerPoint slide. That's data visualization. Sometimes it could be very effective. Uh, Steve Job does this a lot in his presentations. He'll just have a slide with one number in it, and he'll just talk about that number for 10 minutes. Graphs, for sure. So usually when we talk about data visualization, people think of your classic graphs, which is bar graph, line graph, and pie charts. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Visualizations. So what I mean by that is more uh, events visualizations, tree diagrams, network maps, uh, word, word clouds, things like that. Formulas. Uh, so instead of, uh, so a lot of times actually it's very useful to show formulas of the stuff that you do, especially it's more event statistics, like the stuff that our, uh, our company works on. 
All right, the basics. Uh, and I think this is the basics for just even presentation skills. <laughs> so what do you want your audience to know? Why and what's the purpose? Who is it for? Who's the audience? Right, that's actually a pretty important thing. One of the early steps uh, when I create a presentation with data visualization is who's the audience? Exact same information I will present very differently to the IT group versus management team versus operations team versus finance team, right? So audience is super important. And I think the ability to connect the qualitative and the quantitative in a data visualization is key to taking it to the next level. Super quick history. This guy, William Playfair, if you Google him, uh, his Wikipedia page, he is the inventor of data visualization. I think from about like two, 300 years ago. William Playfair, he invented the bar graph, line graph, and pie chart. And this is some of his earlier, uh, earlier graphical data visualization for the city of London in UK. He mostly worked on demographic data, so census and things like that. All right, here's some golden rules for data visualization. Uh, Alberta, Alberto Cairo, he's a pretty famous data visualization advocate. So the four rules, uh, good data visualization has good quality data. They attract the reader's attention. They don't frustrate the reader and they don't mislead the reader. Right. So here's a, here's a good example of that. So keeping it simple. So here we have a, a visual uh, representation of something we want to show. So there's two pictures of pugs in a backpack. So from this graph, you can say the insight is pugs prefer to be carried rather than walk on their own. Right. So from our golden rules, right. Is this memorable? Yeah, I mean, it's cute pugs, dogs in a backpack. Is it useful? Probably not. Is it accurate? Also probably not, right? So just a quick representation. And accurate representation is super important. One of my favorite books uh, in statistics is called How to Lie with Statistics. It's written in 1940s and it's, uh, it, it stands a test of time. But even simple, simplest calculations like averages, you can actually use it to tell the story that you want. And that's another reason why I'm a lot more skeptical as a data scientist and statistician when I see numbers. I'm always like, what's the underlying context? Where are the biases? And what's the data? So here, for example, uh, Fox News is notorious for doing these kind of graphs. So what's wrong with this graph, right? Um, so the context here is uh, Bush had a tax incentives package. And then when that package expires on January 1st, 2013, taxes are going up by 4.6%. So why is that sort of misleading, even though it's technically accurate while well, they change up the axes? So just a quick tip <laughs> changing up the axis is one of the easiest thing you can do to manipulate your data while keeping it accurate so people will look at this especially your average audience will look at this be like wow look at this bar it's five times bigger than this bar looks like my tax is going up a ton i mean in reality 4.6 percent probably is a lot uh but they definitely overrepresented it in this scale. Right, another useful representation of that. Two of the same graph, same information. The insight here on the axis is 19,500 and then 20,000. Government payroll is up. And then this one is government payroll stable because they changed up the axis. Well, your audience. Um, there are different ways to wall your audience. Uh, here's some cool advanced ways of visualizing data. Word clouds, uh, so frequency, the size of the word rep uh, represents the frequency of the words being used in a paragraph or tweets or 
textbooks or whatever text information you, you get it from. Network maps, uh, I really like these things. Uh, depending on what you're using it for, most of the ones I see are pretty useless. They just look cool. But we've actually used it for uh, HR organization data before. So visualizing how different teams are separated pretty interesting and who are really connected and who's on the fringes. So boss and employee relationship, team leader, team member relationship, mentor, mentee relationship, things like that. Oh, actually, oh, this is also really useful for social media stuff. So influencers usually are the ones that's in the middle of these big clusters. Send key diagrams shows supply uh, or any sort of process flow. Tree maps uh, is just a really fancy pie chart. So graphical basics, uh, focus on the three basics uh, in terms of graphs. So bar graph, 95% of the time, I wanna say your data can probably be visualized in a bar graph and it's probably the safest graph you can use for most situations. A line graph, it's a, uh, it's, usually used to show data across time and pie chart shows proportions i think i briefly talked about this last time but pie chart is the least favorite graph of most information designer so there is a very funny feud if you google it uh, there is a camp of data visualizer who says Never use pie chart. Pie chart is the worst thing that's ever invented in human history. And then there's everyone else who just don't really care or likes pie charts. I will say uh, pie charts, because people very, very often misuse pie charts, um, I would be very careful using it. Uh, plus, for the most part, they look pretty ugly. If I'm making a pie chart, I'll usually turn it into a donut chart, which is just a pie chart without the middle. More advanced. So once you can show your top line data, to make your data visualization more advanced is when you start layering in other things. So these three main things are, I think, what advanced people would do. Showing comparison of data, showing causality or relationship in data, and showing multiple variables within a data set. And then other things always uh, have really good documentation. The content and context is super important, the story, and always integrate relevant evidence. So in, in flipping back a little bit to Excel, so there's your classic uh, charts here. You also have your spark lines, which we will talk a little bit about. And then you also have uh, conditional formatting that also visualizes data. So uh, I'll just quickly try this. Um, bar chart, no, bar chart is pretty simple. Back to my Excel sheet, to the data. Oh, there we go, okay. So a annoying thing about Excel is you usually have to make sure the data is side by side. So let's say I want a, a bar chart of type and price. I'll have to do select uh, type. I'm going to do new sheet or shift F11. Always make sure you name your tabs. Control V to paste. So if you didn't get that, I click on the type, control shift down, control C to copy, visualization, control V. Oh, uh, and, and when you switch in between tabs, sorry, I'm just so used to <laughs> these kind of things. Sometimes I just do it without no, uh, realizing. So going back and forth in between tabs, you can do control page down and page up. This lets you uh, scroll through your tabs really quickly. I think control tab also, no, it doesn't. Uh, and then going to price, control V, go back, control, sorry, control C and then control V. Okay, now you have the prices here. So now I'm gonna select both of these columns. So control shift right, control shift down. 
and then I'm going to insert the bar graph. So short keys, alt, insert N, and bar chart, which is C1. Enter. Um, then you will have something that is unintended. Did I miss something? So, yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. All right, um, I think it's been a while since I made a bar chart in here. I will figure that out and come back to you on that uh, in a little bit. Usually the way I do it is using a pivot chart. So I'll select the data here uh, and then I'll do insert and I'll do a pivot chart. There you go. And then you can select type and price, there we go. Oh yeah, I remember what I did wrong, okay. So <laughs> uh, for the bar chart, because you have to summarize the information, you actually have to create a summary table first. So an extra step that I forgot to do was to do, let's see, taking this data and actually do a summary table first, which is using your pivot table, right? And then you would do insert bar chart. There we go. So this summarizes the data. Uh, and then making sure we have the price information up here. Here we go, okay. Sorry for the mix up. Did I lose anybody on that? Any questions? Okay, cool. And then we'll do a, another one. So for the visualization, so this is a pivot chart, uh, which is basically pivot table on steroids. It allows you to actually interact with the graph as well. So you can do type and you can select the data, things like that. And you can also, like before, add a slicer. Do. And things like that. Select all. Cool. All right, and then Let's try to do a line graph. So to do a line graph, uh, usually the dimension or the x-axis is time. So in this case, we have time data. So what we'll do is I'll do a pivot chart again. Control A, select everything, pivot chart. Okay. And then we will have the month. And we will have, let's say, price. And then see how this is the sum of all the units and the prices. Let's say I want to do an average. I just click on values, field setting, and then go to average. So now we have the average across the time. Cool. Any questions? There we go, all right. All right, so back to Excel. Oh, I also wanna show this uh, spark lines and also the conditional formatting. All right, so spark lines, uh, super funky stuff. It basically shows the graph within the cell. So 
let's say we want to do a column. You would just select all your data, insert, let's say line of the data. And then you have the location range, you click here and it actually shows the data inside this little cell here, which is really funky. And then the other one is conditional formatting. So this one I also really like. So if you select, let's say the PSF and you click home, conditional formatting, you have things like color scales, you have different icons, but also the data bars, which is basically a bar chart inside the graph. So you can kind of see which one is the highest and lowest. So we did that, we did the pivot charts, we did the spark lines, uh, yep, great. Okay, so the art of data visualization, being memorable. Uh, so aesthetics, uh, super important, obviously. Uh, unfortunately, if your graph doesn't look very good, uh, people don't look at it no matter how great the insight is, if you don't present things well, uh, people don't really look at it. I guess same goes for products. Uh, if it's not packaged well, even if it's a great product or if it's not marketed well, people don't really buy it. So aesthetics, uh, fonts, uh, super important. I think a bit of a lost art actually, people don't, I don't think people care about fonts as much these days. Uh, I certainly do. So there's different, different fonts portray a different personality, sizes of things. So making sure um, size is appropriate based on the report uh, you're sending. I've seen you know PowerPoints with way too much text on it. Composition, where do you place things? So especially in the dashboarding workshops, we'll talk about composition a lot. Readability, uh, whether you can read things, also very important making sure the picture are high resolution and just, I mean, just try to make it beautiful. Uh, I think that's probably the most important thing. <laughs> Quick tips on deciding which visualization to use. Uh, first off, uh, I think understanding what different graphs is good for. There's um, three main, three, three big, big ones, which is the bar line and the pie. But I would say there is about, uh, all the other ones, so there's maybe 10 to 15, that's really common ones. Uh, you can look it up, um, the scatter plots, um, the things like that. That's uh, fairly commonly used for displaying data. Practice rate chart and then have a secret weapon for each situation and type of data. But always two things you have to think about, measures and dimensions. Uh, that's true for every single data visualization is that there's a measure, there's one or more measures and one or more dimensions. Right, so just some practical best practice, uh, present your data, present your graph, So present your data, what does the number come from? How was it collected? What's the source? Present your graph, what's happening within, what are the axes, the titles, the dimensions, what's the context behind the graph, and then so what, why am I showing you this? And then colors, uh, what's it for, uh, especially in data visualization? Uh, color can actually add dimension. So classic ones, um, you know, if it's, let's say a financial st statement, uh, red is bad and black is good. Uh, usually, uh, you know, let's say you're doing even, let's say, bar charts, uh, you'll, you'll want to have more positive colors on the bigger bars if it's a good thing, and red if it's a bad thing. Attract readers, uh, making it pretty. Uh, sometimes it doesn't have to add dimension. Sometimes you just make it pretty, match the branding colors. Highlighting certain things, uh, showing relationship, the wow factor. But 
definitely seen people overdo it, like this rainbow color sentence here. Okay, just a quick time check. We're at eight. Um, so I'll quickly go through this section and we'll jump into a very quick modeling session. So new functions, um, formatting, uh, the basics, there's borderlines, colors, and structures. So I'll very quickly go through that. So borderline, if you go home, there's this border lines. Usually the main ones you use are um, all, all borders or outside borders. So if you want to do all borders, select all data. So control A, home, and then all borders. Or what I do is control A, alt H, B, A, and that selects the whole thing. So I'll do that again. Control Z to go back, alt, and then H to select home. B is borders, and then A is all borders. Or you can do S, which is, where's S? Outside borders, or T, which is thick. Those are pretty much the three that I use the most. So, you know, if you can do, just want to highlight these ones and make these ones thick borders, whatever. You can do it super quick. What's the other one? Colors. All right. Uh, let's say I want to color the top row. Select the whole row. Alt, H, H, and then you pick the colors. And then Alt, H, what was the other thing? Uh, structure. Don't talk too much about that. Um, hold this. Uh, oh, also auto, what do you call it? auto adjust the size so if you ever have to do this you know this is super annoying it's like oh this bathroom word is cut off i have to do this drag the drag the lines oops see this one's like all kind of weird this psf could be a little smaller whatever all right so the easy thing to do is the formatting cell formatting size one so i do select all and you can do Control h format which is o and then a is for adjusting height and then i is for adjusting width so what i do is i will do control a all h o i and then now everything is nicely formatted and then i'll just format the borders everything looks a little nicer these numbers look a little weird i'll probably just make it central aligned so right here all right, now it looks a lot better. Other things, uh, spacing, wrap, uh, word wrap. So if you type a sentence in the cell to word wrap, you do poem and wrap text or just alt HW, but that makes it kind of funky. Uh, freezing pains. All right, printing. Surprisingly, printing is super annoying in Excel. Uh, a couple of things. So printing, making sure you do print preview. So there's a button on the bottom, page break. So here, if you click on page break, it'll go into this mode. And you will see here, you can actually page break at a specific location. So page one ends here, and then page two starts here, page three, and so on. Um, or you can do control A, control P selects everything. There's like three options here, print active, print the whole thing, or just print the selection margins. You can play around with that. And then one thing I really like to do printer properties, uh, not that page setup, and then you'll have header and foot, footer, different things, different pages, different first sheet, print area, rows that repeat on the top. This one's what I want to talk about. Let's see, sheet. If 
different guidelines, things like that. Righty. These top rows, things like that. All right, some practice. Oh, best practice. So, um, best practice. I always have a cover page. So, the cover page should explain first off title, who is it by, date, and also a description. What's it? What data is in here? Class, etc. I'll skip the rest for now. All right, going straight into modeling. So uh, why do we build models? The whole world is full of action and reaction, cause and effect, chain reactions. And part of it is predictable. And so the predictable part, there's direct and indirect effects. Part of it is random uh, and you can get really, really philosophical about that, but I'll just leave it at this for the purpose of statistics and science. Right, so let's say you play golf. Um, there is direct force, which is, you know, when you, this, hopefully, hopefully people have a pretty good idea of how golf works, but essentially you hit a little ball with a club and there's a direct force where you want it to go. There's some indirect force. So uh, wind, how the ball is, how the club is, how the ground is. And then there's a bunch of little things that there's no way you can predict. And that is true for a lot of things, right? Um, let's say crossing a street, right? You want to go from one end of the street to the other end of the road uh directly you know okay when the light turns green i can cross the street but there's always a part of it that's random maybe some car didn't see you maybe people will cut in front of you maybe the light isn't working properly so there's things that's always cause and effect and there's always things that's just kind of out of your control and the reason I'm talking about this is because, well, that's pretty much all I do, uh, trying to figure out how things work and then whether we can predict them and create sort of an action plan that optimizes it mathematically. So business activities, exact same way, right? How many people will come to have lunch? You can predict it. There's parts of it that's very obvious. Uh, every day at lunch, you know people will be coming. You probably won't be able to guess exactly how many people, but you can tell, for example, Monday versus Friday, there is going to be a different amount of people that comes for lunch. Uh, how does machine break down uh, in a factory within a month? And ultimately, how much profit will a company make? These are all very important cause and effect questions. So the more complex problem you have, and if you want to understand it, how it works so that you can control it, the more you have to untangle the web of every single processes and action within the system. So everything is in a system and we want to break down the system through modeling. A model basically try to create a smaller scale version of the bigger system that you're trying to measure so that you can play around with it and test different things, um, whether, you know, increasing inputs for one area will affect the other and, and things like that. In most case, in, in complex cases, probability comes into play. Uh, are you presenting an estimate or are you doing worst case, uh, maximum, minimum? So in the case of uncertainty, you would do a low high. And that's true for probably everything that you have to do uh, if it's complicated. If you have a lot of control on a certain process and outcome, your range will be narrow. If there's a lot of uncertainty, then your range and outcome will be wider. And usually also, uh, just to know, we usually care about unexpected lows, what we call risk. People are usually just happy with unexpected highs for good things like revenues. So what is a model? 
supermodel. Uh, that's a joke, not really, but kind of, right? What What is a clothing model for? It's supposed to allow viewer to visualize how a piece of clothing will look on a person, right? A mannequin is not a substitute for a human model. And obviously clothes on a rack is not a substitute for how it actually look. And it's a simplified version of reality. So if you think about model trains or model airplanes and things like that, little things kids play with. So why uh, you want to break down complex system into cause and effect for uh, more exact processes. The real world is too complicated, has too many factors, and also it's too costly to experiment in the real world. So we build models to analyze just a few things at a time. And then once you can analyze a few things at a time, then you can add more complexity. And if you want to get really crazy, there's this thing called the theory of everything in physics. So in that theory, it's like everything can be predicted. Um, All right, so uh, we can add more variables to get more complex models to confidently predict uh, effect events or behaviors. Here's an interesting fact. Uh, the hardest thing to make predictions on, and I think most people agree, uh, is actually people. Uh, people, <laughs> people behavior is actually one of the hardest things to predict. Uh, scientists have a lot better uh, luck predicting stars and the universe then to predict how people do things and that's where uh social sciences comes into all right model build building uh very quickly there is an input and there is output and there's usually a goal uh, you want to do so today we're going to talk about very quick uh, uh goal seek model but there is a ton of different models that exist. Um, on Excel specifically, you can do financial modeling, you can do simulation modeling, you could do optimization modeling, you can do predictive modeling, right? So all the different type of analytics. And then for each one of those type of analytics, there's a bajillion different type of models you can build. So I would build very quickly a financial model for a coffee shop. All right, coffee, coffee. All right, so, uh, and then I'm gonna use the financial model to do a goal seek. So what I'm gonna do is, uh, let's say uh, I wanna start a new business and th this could apply to, you know, if you're in an organization, how to budget things, or creating uh, any sort of really calculations on a business model uh, or, or a mini business model. So uh, coffee shop. Well, what is involved in a coffee shop? Uh, let's say I wanna know uh, what, how much money I'll make, right? So there's first off investments and then there's revenue. And there's expenses and crazy things everybody know about. All right. So investments, say we want to start a coffee shop. Number one thing is probably going to be the fixed upfront cost, which is the coffee machine. Oh, this guy, oh, oh H O I to auto adjust the row. Let's call this guy $10,000. So shift four to turn in the dollar sign. What else do we need? Uh, some furnitures. Let's call this $2,000. Right. Okay. So super simplified. Let's say for revenue, we want to know how many, uh, how much revenue we'll make. Well, how do you, how do you know that? So really, really simply, in a coffee shop, you're selling coffee. So cups of coffee per day, let's call it. So let's say you're selling 10 cups per, day, uh, per hour times 12 hours a day. So equals 10 times 12, 
you're selling 120 cups of coffee, price per cup, let's say it's $4. And revenue, two days operating, and let's call it 250 days. So revenue is the sum of all that. Quick tip, alt equal is sums everything there. Uh, oh, actually, this is not a sum. This is a multiplication. So 120 per day times $4. What's happening. All right, 120 per cup times $4 per cup times 250 days. So you're making 120K in revenue. I'm gonna put that here for calculation purposes. I'm gonna do a sum. Okay, expenses, let's say we have rent for the coffee shop, which is, do it quickly inside the cell. So, Actually, just a quick note, usually when we're building a model, we wouldn't even have this 10 times 12. We will actually break this down. So we would have uh, per hour 10 and then uh, hours per day, which is 12. Oh. Uh, it's just so you can change all this later on. So then let's say it's like, oh, 120 120K doesn't seem like a lot. Maybe we'll be selling a lot more. So maybe it's 20 cups per day, uh, per hour. And now you're starting to do some, what we call sensitivity analysis, which is once you change the inputs of the model, you can see the outputs change. All right, so rent, let's call it uh, a rent in Toronto for a coffee shop, I'm guessing. $5,000, I'm, I'm actually not sure. And let's say we wanna have employees. So salary, and we will have for one worker, let's call it 50K. It's probably a lot for a barista. And obviously you will probably have more than 50K uh, uh, more than one worker. Oh, and actually let's do cuts. Oh, uh, what I did there, if you didn't see, uh, I selected the row and I add a new row in between these. So what you do is shift space, selects the row, shift space, selects the row, or you can do control space, selects the column. So shift space, and you do control shift plus, and it adds a row. So if you do shift space, control minus, it deletes a row. Saves a lot of time. Uh, cup cost, cost per cup. So if there's an accountant on the call, uh, I know this is the right way to do it. You would put the cost per cup actually higher up as a as a cost per uh, cut co oh, cut cost cost per cup item uh, under its revenue variable expense. I'm just going to do it as an expense. So cost per cup. So let's say it's 10 cents. Then variable costs, which is 10 cents times however number of cups there are here. So there's 20 cups. Of cups a day and 150 days, so six thousand dollars. Too bad. All right, and I'll get into the profit. It is total revenue minus total cost. All right, so that's a quick. Uh, oh, that's a lot of money. Maybe coffee shops a pretty good idea. Did I make an error somewhere? cups per day, 20 cups per hour, two hours a day, four cups. Oh, there, we missed the rent. 
uh, rents five thousand dollars per month. So total rent. Is that twelve? It's actually usually we put elsewhere because it's not supposed to be an line item. But I would just do this plus variable cost plus salary. Cool. All right. So the profit's pretty good. So a cool thing that you can do now with a model is you can do sensitivity analysis. So you can play around with these numbers. And since everything is all linked together, you can change things up. So let's say the cost goes up to 20 cents. Now you can see the effects on bottom line and things like that. And then uh, a really cool thing I want to do is I want to show you is what, uh, what if analysis so let's say I want to know how much uh, I want to know how many cups I need to make to make 200k a year. So then I would do data. What if go seek? So set profit sale equals two hundred thousand dollars. Is that enough zeros? By changing. Uh, cups per hour, click OK, and it automatically calculates by changing this number so that the profit is 200K. So now cups per hour, you have to make 27 cups per hour. So maybe that means you have to hire another person because that's twice as much work and, and things like that. So I think I will, oh, uh, I think I think I will end off the formal pro portion of this lecture. And I just want to say uh, I will stay back and answer all the questions that's in the chat. But also, thank you much. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining. Uh, we'll send the slides afterwards as well as uh, some feedback forms. So if you could put, please give, give us some feedback and rate us on Google and Facebook, that would be great. So uh, just answering the questions in the chat. Michelle, so pivot table before bar graph. Yes, if you want to show a summary information. But you can do a bar graph on the actual data. The way I did it was a pivot on a bar graph on the summary. Michelle, why no merging cells? Merging cells. I'll tell you why. Uh, let me show my screen again. It's actually a funny thing. So one of the only rules I have at the company <laughs> is that you're not allowed to merge cells. <laughs> And here's why. Um, when the model gets really, really crazy, you're going to start using a lot of short keys. And when you do short keys, being cell makes it really hard to do things. So let's say I have this title bar as merge center. So LHMC merge center. So let's see this cell is merged. And this people do this a lot because it looks better. But then let's say I want to delete this column. I do control space and see it selects this entire thing. So I might delete this entire thing by accident because this thing is merged. And now I won't be able to do actually a lot of the short keys and calculations I need to do because this one merge scale cell screws up a lot of other things. You probably won't notice it as much if you're just doing simple like reporting that's trying to make it look pretty or do some simple analysis, but if you're building any sort of model, merge, merge cell actually causes a ton of trouble. So I'm just going to unmerge this thing. OHMU, unmerge. So alternative is you do right click, format cell, align, and then center cross selection. See now it's individual cells, but this word is actually in the middle. So then when I do a selection for column, it doesn't screw up everything. The 
thank you for lots of thank yous. All right, let's screw up Michelle's question, Fiona's question, access to the recording. Yes. Uh, so a lot of this material we will probably post, uh, post for sure, including the recording. Can you please explain the function you use for the profit part of the example? Sure. So there was no function that I used for the profit. It was, uh, it was just a calculation of relative link. So revenue divided by, sorry, profit equals revenue minus expenses. That's all. Oh, sorry. Uh, were you talking about the solver? I think you're probably talking about the solver. Um, so if you select the cell, beta, what if, goal seek, and then you can set cell. So I want to set profit equals a certain value. So let's call it 300K now. Is that 300K? One, two, three million. And changing cell, okay, let's say I want to change uh, price per cup. That's a good one. All right, so if everything else has to stay the same, I have to charge $5.22 per cup of coffee to get to 300K in profit, which actually wasn't a big change from $4 to $5.22. And that's actually a, a super interesting phenomenon uh, in analytics called pricing analytics. There's a whole discipline about that. Fiona, Mahin, cool. Michelle, it was a point on your slide. Yep. Uh, how how may how may we obtain a certificate for LinkedIn? Uh, I it will be in the email we send as a follow up for this course. Excel does a ton. A recording would be great. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Any add-on I would recommend or use? So we always, we usually do the analysis two pack as an add-on. So I would say this is getting a little bit more to the advanced realm. So I'll share my screen. So uh, usually most of the stuff you have in your, in your tabs is good enough, but this developer tab, actually you can build macros. You have to enable that. You won't see that in your normal um, settings and then solver and data analysis these two functions here under data is also an add-on so excel should come with it but it, to enable the add-on if you're windows i think this is okay i think in mac you might have to do some special thing so you go to file options add add-ins uh, manage excel add-ins go and then solver add-in and then analysis tool pack. And then there's some other ones. And you can actually, it actually gets kind of nuts. You can actually download a lot of other things um, like Cplex, for example, from IBM allows you to do large scale optimization Excel. It's an add-in, things like that. You have to pay for it, those kind of things. So. All right. Uh... Would you know, or can you suggest material we can use so we can practice the things that was discussed? So there's a ton of, I think, online courses available for sure. Um, we are also running Excel workshops and actually on our website, there are some Excel courses you can take for free. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, no, there's a ton of material online for Excel. YouTube, YouTube is great. 